everyone. Welcome, Keith. We're very happy and excited to have you. And uh, welcome to everyone coming for the first time. And we will now turn over to Keith as he leads us into this very important and very critical study. Thank you all. Uh, before, Keith, before Keith begins, Rochelle, I uh, just want to ask everyone who's on the platform, just let your friends know that we are now Facebook Live so they can now log into Facebook Live. Um, just tell somebody, text somebody right now so they can actually get the blessing that is in store for us. Over to you, Keith. Well, welcome, everyone. Why don't we start with a word of prayer and then we'll jump into our discussion this evening. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you are the one who made the mind you know how it works and you know um you know each of us in our inward parts we pray lord that this presentation would not just be informational but transformational and we ask that your spirit would be with us bring healing to each of us this evening we pray in jesus name amen amen all right let's see if i can successfully do what it is that I want to do um, in sharing my screen here. I'm gonna, tr I'm gonna try. I might have to do this more than once if it doesn't work out quite right. Okay, that's good. So do you see just a whole slide? Yes. Okay, it should say holistic healing. Correct. All right. Then that means I have what I need, which is my notes off to the side here, and you guys have all the rest of the goodness. Um, it's probably no secret. I mean, it's the reason we're doing this presentation. Depression and anxiety is a huge problem in our world today, uh, especially in developed countries. This is recognized by the World Health Organization, as well as many other organizations around the world. Uh, statistically, uh, if we look at, you know, the 2018-2019 academic school year and college students, we can see that uh, of all the issues that they had, depression and anxiety were at the top of the list. This affected uh, a lot of people. Um, I think it starts before that, um, but certainly it, it continues on for a while. And what's amazing to me is um, you look at what the, these percentages are so large compared to other things, but they're probably caused by some of the other things that you see later on down on the list. You know, later on down on the list, it's probably some of the underlying issues grief, loss, family, stress, these are all contributing factors to depression and anxiety. Uh, Barna Group recognizes that only one third of young adults feels cared for by others. That is a huge problem. If you don't feel like anybody cares about you, it's going to definitely shape uh, your worldview. And so, just bringing some of this out as, as it shapes our discussion. Pew Research Center, they said that most teens see anxiety and depression as a major problem among their peers. Um, and that's exactly what we see uh, in other graphs. Now it looks like I had a little bit of animation. If we go down the page, we can see um, some of these statistics a little bit more up close they reported a depression and anxiety as a major problem among peers, 70% did. And then on down the list, you see, it was bigger even than drug addiction and alcohol and teen pregnancy. Now, again, some of those um, like teen pregnancy, it could be a reason for depression and anxiety. Um, so, but anyway, as people identify their, their problems, they're saying, I'm depressed, I'm anxious and it's a huge factor. Go on down the page at this uh, and we see, or at least we should see, uh, when I look at this, the title says mental health concerns across income boundaries, but teen pregnancy is seen as a much bigger problem. 
by teens and lower income households. The point I want to make with this, though, is, is not having to do with the teen pregnancy. It is that if you look at the numbers all the way down the page, depression and anxiety doesn't seem to matter what income you're in. It's about the same. There are greater disparities statistically on other issues depending on what your income level is. Interestingly enough, $75,000, at least in developed countries, is the magic number for satisfaction and happiness as far as income and wages goes. In other words, if you don't, you can make more than $75,000, but you won't be any happier, right? And if you make less than $75,000, you might feel anxious about that and think that you could be happier. And sure, true, if you made 30,000 and then jumped to 75,000, you'd probably be happier. But going over that number doesn't increase your overall happiness in life. Yeah, I'm not very quick with the math, but I'm wondering what is 75,000 US dollars in Jamaica? I'm just trying to figure that out. <laughs> I guess we can apply it wherever we are. But, um, I don't but, yeah. but I would say this, and you make a good point, $75,000 in Jamaica, it could be a lot more than what it is here in the US. I think the point of the number is that there is a number in every country where you feel pretty good that you can take care of your needs, your family's needs. You have enough to take care, to save, to do all the things that you need to do. But not so little that you can't do that and not so much that you can do way more than that. In other words, it's, it's this amount where it's, it's kind of just right. You, know? you, you don't have too much, you don't have too little, you have the right amount, you can take care of all the things you need to take care of and you're satisfied. And I think that's what it's really driving at. And that number, I'm sure, is different no matter where, wherever you're at. But yeah. There is a number. So here is something I found from NIH, which is National Institute of Health. It's a, it's a government website, at least in the US. You can see it's this past year treatment received among adolescents with major depressive episode. Uh, you can see there's a big chunk of this pie graph or circular graph that says 60% didn't receive any treatment. They're depressed, they're anxious, they're not getting any help, right? Um, only 40% get some kind of treatment. So there's a lot of people out there that are struggling. Um, and while there are some treatments out there, there are things that people may turn to um, some of those treatments can probably create other problems. Uh, certainly that's true with um, some medications. You know, some help people, some create other issues. And that's just the nature of medications. They have side effects. And especially if there haven't been long-term studies on large populations on what it does to the human system, you know. And it may not be even that it, the side effect is another mental issue. It could be that the side effect is another physical health issue, you know, might cause damage to your kidneys or something else. So, um, you know, if you're not doing that, maybe you're turning to drugs and alcohol. Maybe that's your medication because they have numbing effects. And so people will turn to those. Um, some people will turn to media as their medication. You know, I can escape in this world and forget all of my problems and get my dopamine high and I'm all good. Uh, but there is a type of therapy I have read about, I've become aware about from other people, other medical professionals, some at my church, and doesn't require any of those things. It's called CBT or Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of that tonight. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but it's, it's quite interesting. So here's the Mayo Clinic talking about cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. Um, it is a common type of talk therapy or they call psychotherapy. It helps you become aware of inaccurate or negative thinking so you can view challenging situations more clearly and respond to them in a more effective way. 
Um, and I want to bring it back around some of these key points that we're looking at as we talk through this. Uh, some of the key terms. Notice thinking, which is your thoughts. Um, that, that's going to be real key as we get close to the end of this presentation. Uh, some other things that they talked about, the thoughts and the feelings. They encourage you to talk about what are your thoughts? What are your feelings? It's not the Freudian view where you're laying down on a couch and tell me about your childhood. You know, it's not that. They're not, they're just saying, tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you're feeling. What's troubling you? And then they're trying to help you reshape those thoughts so that it reshapes those feelings. This is from the APA or American Psychological Association. They also talk about uh, what is cognitive behavioral therapy and we wanna hone in on some things here. They're based, uh, they say problems are based partly uh, on fault of unhelpful ways of thinking. Okay, so we're reinforcing this idea. Also in part by learned patterns of unhelpful behavior. So thinking, behavior, uh, they say people suffer from psychological problems can learn better ways of coping with them, uh, thereby relieving their symptoms and becoming more effective in their lives. So, and again, notice thinking behavior, thinking behavior. I want to hone in on that. Um, again, they're reinforcing this idea, thinking and behavior. Okay, what about psychology today? They said, what is, what is this CBT? Um, so it's a therapy that focuses on modifying dysfunctional emotions, behaviors, and thoughts. Okay, so I think you guys are starting to get the idea. Now, now I'm going to show you a video and hopefully I am set up to be able to show you, let's see, share computer sound. I want to show you um, how emotions work in the brain. Okay, so I'm going to show you a short video about this. It's probably three to five minutes long, maybe not even that long. Science has shown that when we are experiencing strong emotions, the limbic system, the part of the brain that is primitive and developed before rational thought, starts to override our thinking. When we are in the heat of emotion, we often do not think clearly. One thing you will learn in counseling is that when emotions are high, rational thinking is often low. Neuroscientists have called this process as hijacking. The amygdala, which is part of the limbic system, has powerful potential. It has also been called the fear center because when it is hyperactive, such as when we are experiencing a strong emotion, such as anxiety, we are not thinking clearly. And the higher functioning part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, is what keeps this limbic system in check. But how do we release the brain from the limbic system's grasp? We use it. We think. We analyze. We contemplate. The brain is hijacked, and the way to release it from the limbic system's grasp is to get the higher functioning brain more involved. When we rationally think and think rationally, we often are no longer so caught up in unhelpful emotional states or urges. If we are honest with ourselves, we may find that we have irrational thoughts going on in our minds often. You may find that when you try to understand the underlying thought processes, beliefs, or the expectations you have about certain events in your life, you may find that they were largely irrational, meaning not realistic, not true, didn't make sense when examining the evidence. We must be perfect. We cannot fail. We may tell ourselves this often. We must be accepted in every situation. We must be approved and accepted by everyone. We must not experience stress or frustration and so forth. And when we change our thinking about events, we feel better and our behavior again is more positive and constructive. Even when we fail, we will still accept ourselves and move forward. We start to have a high frustration tolerance, what we want, instead of a low frustration tolerance. We learn to accept ourselves and our situations and respond to them more positively. We start to acquire correct perceptions about life, approaching life and accepting life as it is, and with some discomfort, some pain, some stress, but knowing we do not need to give in to deal with it, which is more realistic, helpful, 
and very constructive. So let's get to the core of the issue. Let's start to learn to identify those thoughts and beliefs that may harm us personally and that are unhelpful and lead to our using. In the next videos, I will cover how we can identify our thoughts by using certain criteria. This will really help to identify if they are helpful or unhelpful beliefs. Also, keep in mind that Albert Ellis talked about thoughts and beliefs that are harmful to us as irrational and self-defeating, so I will use that term irrational. Essentially, we want to try to identify irrational thoughts. These irrational thoughts, again, could be the fears about the future without your drug of choice, but also situations that contribute to our using and push us to use our drug of choice, whatever it might be. You are not an irrational person, but the underlying belief the brain generates may not be rational. All right, so I hope that was helpful. I think he explains that probably better than I could, and, and certainly in a, in a concise way. Um, I want to encourage you to think of what's going on, especially as we've talked about CBT in this way. Your thoughts essentially create feelings. Um, this is where your feelings come from. It's, it's how you think. And those feelings influence how you act or how you behave, right? And over time, if you act in a particular way enough, it becomes a habit. And um, whatever ways that you are habitual, uh, what people know you as, that's called your character, okay? So to condense all that, thoughts create feelings, create actions, create habits, create character. That's all we're getting at with this. But if you think through it rationally, like he was just encouraging us to do, that's the flow, right? So if we can go back and adjust the thoughts, we can adjust character, essentially. And other things like habits and actions and feelings. Um, let me give you an example. If someone says something to you and you think that it's not nice, um, and that unkind gesture causes you to feel horrible. So you yell at them, okay? If you're known for yelling at everyone, that's your character. That's how others view you because it's who you are. Make sense? All right, so I wanna talk about healing. Ultimately, um, we can know that people are anxious. We can know they're depressed. We can know that about ourselves. Um, but I want to talk about the ideal of healing in the Bible. The ideal of healing in the Bible comes from uh, this very interesting Greek word, sozo. I don't know if you've ever come across this before, but um, it's, word, it's used in a variety of passages. Okay? I'm going to go through some of those passages with you. Mark 5.23 is one uh, passage that it's used in. Uh, it says, And besought him greatly, saying, uh, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Where is sozo in here? It's the word healed. Okay? So sozo means healed. Um, here's another passage, another way that it's used. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, um, I may, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said to her daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith have made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that very hour. Where is healing here? Well, she was made whole. It's the same word, sozo, okay? So healed, whole, it means both of these things. Matthew one twenty one. Sorry, this is my clock going off. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Well, where is the word here? Is the word save? This is sozo. Um, it's also used in this passage, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's sozo. That's 
healing. It's being made whole. It's salvation. This is the Bible's idea of what healing means. It's very holistic. It's not just saving you from your temporal, immediate problems. It's saving you as a whole person, mind, body, spirit, all of that. Here it is again. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, where is it here? The word saved. This is sozo. God is doing a complete restoration. It's what he wants to do with all of us. And here it is in Acts 2.21. And you'll notice I'm going to kind of beat this drum a little bit. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right? What about here? For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This is sozo, many times. If you look at the Greek, this is how the word is used, to save, rescue, preserve, safe and unharmed. It means to bring safely to, to cure, heal, restore to health. So when Jesus healed people, that's why it was used, because this is part of the embodiment of this word. It means to save, preserve from being lost. So it's a, it's a rescuing, to deliver from, to set free. So it's, it's breaking chains, to rescue from unbelief or to convert. It means to bring within the pale of saving privilege, to save from final ruin, to be brought within the pale of saving grace, to be in the way of salvation, heal, rescue, save. This word embodies a lot of meaning, right? A lot of meaning. And so um, this is what Jesus wants to do with each one of us. He wants uh, sozo. I don't know why I have a blank slide, but if you look at how this word is used in the Bible, and it's a, it's a Greek word, so it's only used in the New Testament. Um, although I think the concept is probably in the Old Testament. You can see how it's used. Most of the time, it's used to show you that Jesus wants to save you. In fact, it's 84.5% of the time it's used in the Bible. Healing is equated with salvation. Okay? Healing is equated with salvation. And it's with that thought, you guys are just, you're going to have to deal with me one more time because I like Revelation chapter three, okay? I think we can draw so many lessons out of this. And so while I used it in my testimony, I'm going to use it again, but from a slightly different angle, okay? So if you didn't see the testimony, you can see how I used it then. Go to the other video. You can find it on Time Science Facebook channel um, and see it there. The Laodicean church is the very last church that John is writing to. There were seven churches in Asia Minor, and he wrote letters to them all. Um, it represents the last church in history. And so what is written is really a description of God's people at the end of time. Okay, so here we have the first verse in this, this section. It's the angel to the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things um, say the amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Um, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. We're going to start from the standpoint because... Uh, as we've been learning in this presentation, we've been learning that there's a flow. There's thoughts that do feelings, that do actions, you know, and on, on down the list. Notice here what he points out. He says, I know your, your works. This is an action, right? This is something that you are doing. Uh, actions become habits and habits become character. But what are these actions formed from? They're formed from your thoughts by way of your feelings, okay? So just keep that in mind as we're going through this. So he says, you know, I wish 
or because you are lukewarm uh, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So they have a very, it's a very poor description that they have according to Christ. Like this is, this is not complimentary. He's saying you're, you're in poor, poor shape, okay? And because you say I am rich, I've become wealthy, I've need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They have some very high opinions about themselves. Uh, these are their thoughts, okay, their thoughts about their selves. Their thoughts form their feelings, which lead to their works, okay? So you can see where we're going with this. Now, then what does he say? I have advice for you. This is essentially the divine prescription, if you will, for healing. All right. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Why? Because you think you're rich, but you're not. Um, and white garments, you need those because you think you're clothed, but you're not. And that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see because you think you can see, but you really can't. Um, the portion I covered before in my testimony uh, video I did, I, I briefly touched on these elements. Well, I touched on them in more, TOT, the more detail. I'm going to briefly just kind of graze the surface here. The gold which we need is faith. Uh, you can find that uh, in, in Peter, First Peter, I think it is. Um, the white garments which you need is righteousness. And what we can't see um, is that we need we, we can't see that we need those things and we can't see it because we're blind. And so we need ISAB to, you know, help our spiritual understanding so that we can see that we, we need those things. Now, if you read that message backwards, like I like pointed out in my testimony, we don't have the ability to see, or we don't see, I think we can be made to have the ability, but we don't see that we need righteousness by faith. That's reading it backwards, right? This is what we need. Okay. That's so what Jesus is telling us. So he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Um, why does Jesus tell us these things? It's because he loves us. And uh, you'll see that he says repent, which is to say, you need to do a 180. Whatever you're doing, you need to do something different. So your actions need to be adjusted. Change your actions. Okay, but before you can change your actions, what do you have to change? You have to change your feelings and you have to change your thoughts. So in saying you need to do a 180, he's essentially saying, I know what you think about yourself, but those thoughts that you think about yourself, which leads to the feelings that you have about yourself, they're not right. And I'm here to give you a reality check. Okay, so change your actions. But to change your actions, you're going to have to adjust the feelings about yourself and the thoughts about yourself, okay? And, and look in the divine mirror that's going to show you what you are really like. Um, so you have to think and analyze and realize. And you have a need. And ultimately, that need is Jesus, Okay. And Jesus can provide all the healing that's necessary to make you into that, that new person. Now, I should say that the other implication with that is after those actions change, then you're going a different direction. But those actions should be forming new habits and develop a new character. So... It's fascinating because Jesus, he starts in the middle of that flow chart that we gave. But if you look between the lines, he's really addressing all the whole spectrum. You just have to think about it, right? In order to change your works, you have to think and feel differently. But when your works are changed, you're going to have different habits and a different character. So we see 
what Jesus is really getting at if we really break this down. So you need a different character. And he says, I behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You know, I like the painting, uh, which shows Jesus on the other side of the door. And there's no handle on the side that Jesus is on. The handle is only on the side that you're on. Because you are the one that has the power to let Jesus in or not. He knocks. He's a gentleman. He doesn't barge his way in. He, he doesn't open the door. You open the door. All right? So you have to let him in. Now, letting him in, notice, is also in action, right? It is in action. You have to do that. But to do that action, how do you feel about Jesus? What are your thoughts about Jesus? Are you going to let him in, right? There's some changes that have to happen first in the heart. That's what we're talking about. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That knocking is at the heart, which we typically associate with our feelings, we have to adjust our irrational feelings and let those be adjusted by our thinking that says, I need to let Jesus in. That's the action to perform. All right. All right, Keith. Yes. I, I have a provocative question, right? No, you can, you can take the question no, or, or you can answer no, or if you, if you plan to answer it further down, then you can do that. So, I'm listening to you, I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm looking at, I'm envisioning the chart that you just, uh, you put up um, earlier, a few slides before, that talks about the relationship between our thoughts and our character. And mm -hmm. it's, it's on, that, on that gradient. Um, but looking at what Jesus is saying here, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if we let him in, then he will stop with us. Mm -hmm. The question is, is this in some way suggesting that, I could ask it another way, but I'm going to ask it this way. Is this suggesting or hinting that if somehow my mind and my thoughts are not wholesome or I still, I am experiencing depression and anxiety and all of those things, but I believe I have given my heart to Christ. I have become a Christian. I have been, been baptized. I go to church, all that good stuff. Um, but I still have those issues, um, even beyond, um, beyond depression. You know, I just don't like people, for example, <laughs> right? Um, is it possible for me to have those thoughts, but I have let Christ in? That's really the question. You know, is it possible for me to have those thoughts, but still I have really let Christ in? Um, is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm not suggesting that it's not. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do that. Um, the reason I'm walking through the passage like this is to reinforce um, what I was showing about cognitive behavioral therapy, right? I'm just trying to show that Revelation chapter three lines up with this concept, okay? Not trying to suggest that if you've accepted Jesus into your heart, you don't have any mental health issues at all. So thank you for clarifying that. I'm not doing that, not at all. And I'll share more uh, about that in a little bit, okay? Um, when you invite Jesus in, it requires that you listen to him, right? He's there for you to talk, have a meal. Um, when you're having a meal with somebody, that's generally what you're doing. You're talking, you're getting to know each other better. If you're listening, you're also going to be doing what? Thinking, right? You're going to be thinking. You're going to be thinking about what they have to say. And the whole point of Jesus coming in and supping with you and talking with you is, is he's there to help readjust your thinking because he's just before this, he's told us, look, I know what you think about yourself, but your thoughts about yourself are not right. You need an adjustment. Okay. So there's where we come in with the, 
you know, if you have Jesus in there, are you still going to have problems? You could still have problems, but Jesus is there to help you fix those problems, right? So it doesn't mean that you don't have problems. You let Jesus in, and he's there to be the great calibrator. Um, so you're evaluating what you're, you're, they're saying and deciding, well, how do I feel about that, right? Because those thoughts are going to affect what Jesus told me. How do I feel about that? And that's going to cause me to act in a particular way. All right. Then it says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And this conversation with Jesus implies that there's something you need to do, right? Just like before, he said, be zealous and repent. There's something that we need to do. You have to act. In acting is part of the process in how we overcome, all right? Do we do it on our own strength? No, I don't think this passage suggests that as all, at all, because without Jesus' intervention, you could never do anything. Jesus is the one to rebuke you. Jesus is the run you have to let in. Jesus is the one that has to clean up the mess. He's the one that has to recalibrate your thinking and walk you through this whole process, right? But he's saying in walking through that process, you can overcome, okay? But that is an action. To repent means you change your habits and you're choosing new ones by the strength and power of Jesus Christ, right? None of us can, can do this on our own. Essentially, what the human race is, is suffering from is like a long, a long string of people who are addicts. And we were a bunch of like drug addicts in some way, shape, or form. And that can take many different, um, it, can, it can look many different ways, right? For some people, it's actual drugs. For other people, it's, it's media addiction. For some people, it's pornography addiction. And these things can act like drugs. Uh, some people become obsessed with other people. We just take everything to the extreme. That is the simple nature. We are completely unbalanced. We don't know how to behave properly. We go clear to one end or the other. And, and so in some form or another, whether it's spiritually or physically or what have you, we're all essentially like a bunch of drug addicts that are struggling to get free from some kind of addiction and be recovered. And Jesus is here to help us overcome and get recovery. Um, one of the things um, that I think that we were um, listening to earlier and looking at is, um, I think reinforced by this passage, people that are depressed, they're anxious, they say things about themselves to themselves that aren't necessarily true, right? They might have some degree of truth to it, but they magnify it or they blow it out of proportion. This scripture speaks to that. It says in Psalm 15, one through two, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness, notice this, and speaks truth in his heart. We have to stop lying to ourselves. That's not easy. And it's not easy because the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17, nine, that we all have hearts that are desperately wicked deceitful above all else. So essentially, we are all battling with telling ourselves the truth. And the Bible says, you need to do that. You need to speak truth in your heart, right? In your mind. Speak truth in your mind. Why? That truth gets analyzed. That truth becomes how you feel, how you act, your habits, your character, right? The word of God is so transformative. If we think about it, the end result is we can be completely transformed. That's the power of the word of God. Um, so most of us tell ourselves lies every day that are not true. Uh, that means we have to get in the habit of speaking God's word, the words of truth to correct our thinking. 
Um, one of the ways this happens is, I know just, I'll pick on an example, ladies, especially when you're younger, you're comparing yourselves to all these different things and you're telling yourselves all these things that are not true. You know, um, I'm overweight, I'm not pretty, um, all of these things. And you're reinforcing those thoughts and how you feel, right? And it's shaping how you act. It's developing some of your habits because to combat that, you might, uh, you might then dress a certain way or you might not believe in yourself enough to even um, take care of yourself and you just kind of, you know, let go. And, you know, you can see how some of this like reinforces a bad line that we don't want to go down. Um, and then guys, we do it to ourselves too in, in different ways. Uh, you know, guys have a tendency to struggle more with the uh, success. You know, am I doing enough? Am I providing enough for our family? Uh, I'm just a loser. I don't have anything to show. You know, I'm broke and, you know, I can't rub, you know, I can't rub two pennies together. You know, I, don't, I just don't have enough. Um, and so it, it speaks to you and you think you're worthless because of it. Um, so there's all kinds of ways we can tell ourselves lies, but what we need to do is put more of the word of God in our hearts that we're not telling ourselves lies or telling ourselves what God thinks about us. And that's the truth. So it's a, it's a truth. So I want to share some statements. Um, I've been building up to these really. There's three statements I want to read from Ellen White's writings. And I think this is fascinating because where we started was, this is the world, this is what medical science has to tell us. We know this thing about cognitive behavioral therapy, but just look at some of the key words in these quotes. I think it's fascinating. It says, if the thoughts are wrong, the feelings will be wrong. And the thoughts and feelings combined make up the moral character. Now, that was written in 1885. That's a long time ago. That's way before CBT, right? And you can see uh, the wisdom that's there. Our thoughts have to be adjusted because if they're wrong, there's a train wreck from there on out, you know? Um, here's another one. This is from the book Christ Object Lessons. It says, the actions repeated form habits. Habits form character. And by the character, our destiny for time and eternity is decided. That's a heavy statement, you know, and so it, it makes you sit there and think like, oh, wow, what are my actions and habits? Because I wouldn't want to do anything that makes my character ugly for Jesus so that, you know, it would, you know, damage my eternal salvation in some way. This can be taken a variety of different ways, but a simple way to think about that is... Um, the Bible will list behaviors and it says, you know, like in, I think it's in Galatians chapter five, it's, it talks about a list of behaviors and it says, those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, a lot of those things, if you look at them, they are things that, you know, people are habitually doing. In other words, they're said in such a way, like if you're an idolater, it's not that you worshiped an idol once, it's that you keep doing it. You do it so many times, so many actions that it, that it becomes a habit and it's part of who you are. You are now identified as an idolater. It's part of your character. So that is what we're getting at. Um, Signs of the Times, 1912, said, it is not through one act that the character is formed, but by a repetition of acts that habits are established and character is formed. So how careful we need to be about repeating the right thing. And then, you know, on the flip side of this, how awesome it is that if we form right, have right actions, they can become habits and good habits, you know, that, that form a solid character. And you can have some things with you your whole life that are just awesome gifts from God if you cultivate it, right? So I just want to briefly touch on this. Uh, when it comes to mental health, there's a lot of things that we can do in physical health that affect our mental health. Um, 
if you just think about it, nutrition, how you eat affects your body. And if you eat clean, we'll use that term, if you eat clean, you're going to have a clear mind, right? And that mind is going to be better able to discern. You take a quick example in the Bible, take Daniel. I mean, that guy was like, I'm just going to eat clean. And he was off the charts when he went to Nebuchadnezzar, you know, even though he went to Babylon U, it was okay. I mean, he outdid everybody. And, you know, I'm sure he had a, he had a lot to deal with. You th you're talking about a guy, he's an outsider. And as an outsider, he comes in, he's got all the right answers, but then it makes all the people around him, they're jealous. And they got people always trying to get rid of him, off him, all kinds of stuff. It would take a lot of mental fortitude to deal with that, right? And so I believe that his physical habits affected his mind in such a way that he was able to deal with it. He had a good, solid mental health. And, and I'm sure that being in the word and having that solid relationship with God was a big part of that. But can't deny by reading the Bible that is that his physical health had a lot to do with his performance. Um, there's the exercise. I mean, you can look at study after study after study. If you exercise, you will feel better. Your mental health will improve. When you exercise, your body releases happy chemicals. And it's just like, man, I feel good. You know, I feel happier. Um, it's interesting. There's there's different foods um, that affect your body in, in certain ways. And one of them that I have read about as being good for your brain is actually shaped by the, like the brain. It's a walnut, you know, and it's good for promoting uh, mental health. Um, there's water. You think about if you're dehydrated, you're not thinking clearly. Things aren't moving like they're supposed to. If you lack water, water affects your circulatory system, right? If you're dehydrated, your blood's gonna get thicker and it's going to not flow as properly, which means you're not getting the oxygen to your brain that you need. So I've, I've done a talk on hemoglobin. Maybe I'll do that with you guys sometime. It's a fascinating, I can talk about how Hemoglobins and prophecy, okay, this is really fascinating. We'll talk about that sometime. <laughs> At least I believe it's in prophecy. Um, there's the sunshine. You walk outside, you get that vitamin D, it's going to give you a boost. You're going to feel much better. Um, your serotonin levels go up. There's all kinds of good things that result from sunshine um, in your life. People that are indoors all the time with no windows, they get depressed. Let me tell you, I work in an office with no windows. It is not good. <laughs> so um, temperance, you think about this. Now, temperance, uh, the definition we're talking about here is, you know, you want to moderately take in the things that are good for you and abstain the things that are bad. Uh, if you take in even too much of a good thing, you can feel terrible about yourself, which reinforces those bad thoughts, right? And uh, can lead to depression. Um, so you want to be temperate, you know, air, fresh air, man, that's another thing. Again, air affects, you got to get the right amount of oxygen in your system. If you don't have the right amount of oxygen to your system, it's not getting to your brain. You're not thinking clearly. If you're not thinking clearly, what's going to happen? You're going to get depressed, be anxious about stuff. Rest. I mean, I, everybody needs rest. If you do not rest, you're going to get stressed out. If you get stressed out, what's going to happen? You're going to be depressed, right? You can see where this is going. I mean, and of course, the last uh, law of health, you might say, these are biblical principles, eight laws of health, trust in God, right? If you don't trust God, what's your foundation? I mean, you're, you're just like a ship without a rudder. And again, if you don't have something that you can make that foundation on. You don't have anything you can trust you're going to be depressed because your life is just going who knows where. So um, those are very important aspects of our mental health is that how we relate to physical health in maintaining a healthy lifestyle. 
These are simple principles. Anybody can do them. And they're not expensive. You know, you can do these on the cheap and it's, it's, it'll do wonders for you. Now, I want to... Uh, yeah, just before you motor on to Bible characters, do you want to take a question or two questions? We can take a question. I'm about to get a little more interactive, but we can take a question. Oh, okay, all right. Well, okay. Kason, there was a question in the chat. I think you had highlighted it. You're on mute, you're on mute. Yeah, Keith, uh, someone was asking, I guess, because you were touching about men, um, mental health issues, is there a way to witness to a person diagnosed with a mental illness? I think there's all kinds of ways you can witness to a person with mental illness. Uh, one of the primary ways that you can witness to them is by encouragement. Most of the people that are dealing with this are dealing with lies that they're telling to themselves you know, a distortion of reality. And if you can help lift them up and bring them back to reality, that will do tremendous things for them. That's one way you can witness. There are very subtle ways you can witness. Um, it's not like undercover witnessing or covert witnessing or anything like that, but it's, it's subtle in that if you can implement for them or help them implement some of the things I just talked about, Hey, why don't we go for a walk outside on a sunny day, right? You're going to kill several things. You're going to get exercise, sunshine, and fresh air right there, right? And if you have good, encouraging conversation where they can know that they can trust in God, you just hit four out of eight, right? Real fast. So this is a way that you can witness to people in an unconventional way, but still a very important, helpful way. Another thing that you can do, and it's along the lines of encouragement, is help them reason through their thoughts. If you can show them that what they're thinking is really irrational, you know, it can help recalibrate their thinking and bring healing um, to them. So those are the few ways off the top of my head. Um, it might help them. Some, it probably depends on the person. It might help them if you sent them, you know, some articles or something, uh, something encouraging to read or some medical science um, on. Um, that probably wouldn't be as helpful, though, as encouragement. People really just need somebody to come along beside them much of the time. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Um, but I just want to kind of open up the floor for a couple of minutes. Does anybody here, can you think of any characters that struggled with anxiety and depression in the Bible? Elijah. It doesn't have to be a lifetime. It could be moments of this. Anybody? Elijah. Yeah, Elijah. Who else? Saul. Saul. Well, yeah, Saul had a <laughs> multitude of issues. <laughs> uh, more than anxiety and depression. <laughs> What about Jonah? What's that? Jeremiah. Jonah. Yeah, Jonah and Jeremiah for sure. I mean, the book of Lamentations <laughs> is pretty much a, you know, a, a, a outflow of words from, from those experiences. One that comes to my mind is David. You know, you think about some of the Psalms, he's just talking about how he's in the depths of despair. Um, you yeah. know, the nice thing about the Psalms is they have a nice balance because you'll find those identification points where you're in the depths of despair, but then he balances it by saying, you know, he looks to God and there's other Psalms that are very encouraging and, you know, he's, he's, you know, showing where the healing comes from. Somebody's raising their hand, yeah. I guess. Abbasi's hand is up. Go ahead, Abbasi. Solomon. <laughs> Solomon? Yeah, Solomon. you think about that. He had yeah. some regrets later on in life, you know? Um, yeah. So this is not, it's, it's not a 2020 struggle. This is a struggle from humanity for a long time. If you think back after Adam and Eve sinned, think about them looking at something that died for the very first time. That had to be hugely depressing right? Because nothing had ever died. 
And you start to think of the mental anguish that those two people are going through. They now know that the whole race has been plunged into this dark thing. And they're responsible for who knows how many lives. And think about then that their children, one of them murders another one. I mean, the mental anguish has got to be tremendous um, that they would have gone through. So this is not a new thing. This is a human problem. It's something that we deal with um, because of the effects of sin. So I don't want you to feel like you're alone if you're on this uh, Zoom call with us tonight. You're not alone. It's not new. You're not the only one who's ever gone through this. Uh, many people have gone through this. So I just wanted to take a poll. You don't have to raise your hand um, on this. But if you feel comfortable, uh, and maybe somebody who can see everybody can count, how many of you have struggled with anxiety and depression? Anybody? I mean, if you don't want to raise your hand, it's fine. I'm, I'm not going to press on this. Um, but I will tell you that I have struggled with this for... Um, most of my life, most of my life, probably, probably close to 30 years. So, Keith, you're kind of breaking up. Uh, are you going to break up? I barely heard you. I barely heard you. Um, yeah, you're my internet. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, you're. Yeah, yeah, it's it's breaking up too. yeah, it is. It is breaking up. Yeah, it is. It is breaking up. Oh, bummer. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, can you can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly? Hear me clearly? I can now. Okay. So maybe we're good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm hearing you now. Uh, you're you're about to say that you're, you're talking about depression that you've been struggling with that for most of your life. Yeah, most of my life. So probably about thirty years, I've been struggling with depression, um, which starts to give away my age because you can tell I'm probably older than 30 years. <laughs> um, it's, it's a terrible, terrible thing to go through. I, I've been in some really dark places. When I was in my early 20s, um, I started going to college. I was 19. I started at 19. I took a year off between high school and university. And um, I didn't think I was going to college. My parents told me I had to. I didn't apply to college the year before, so that's part of the reason I took a year off. <laughs> um, I just thought I was gonna go get a job, whatever. And they were like, no, you're going to school. And I was like, well, I don't have any money, so I don't know how that's gonna work. Um, but they said, figure it out. So I applied. I had to retake the ACT, which is a a test that helps you get, you know, kind of where you're, you have to take it before you can go to college. It kind of tells you where you're at. The first time I took it, I didn't do that. I didn't do that great. It was okay. Uh, a lot of people expected a lot more out of me, but I guess I disappointed them. Um, so I had to retake that to improve some of my scores to, you know, really do better for school. And so I studied some while I was off during that year. So I go in at 19. Shock to me, my score was high enough the second time around that I got lumped in with all the honor students. So basically, I was placed in the top 10%. Um, I was in a room with a bunch of people. I didn't know why I was there. Nobody told me. They had to like say, oh, because I'm there asking me to take all these classes. I'm like, somebody got got a clue they were like do you know why you're with this group I was like no I don't, I don't have any idea 
like, well, you've been placed in the honors program. I was like, okay. Um, and then, you know, they basically told me they could work out the finances, which I didn't know how I was going to pay for school anyway. And I started on a full ride scholarship. I didn't keep that, um, partly because of this issue. Um, but I started out in these, in, in this group. And so a couple of my classes, they were normal classes, but I would take them with just only honor students. They kept us kind of in a, that was our peer group, you know, they, I guess they thought we could relate to each other better. Um, and I remember taking a health class and in the health class, the professor was a medical doctor and she started talking about this topic, anxiety and depression. And she asked how many people in this room have struggled with depression. And <clears throat> most of the hands went up. And I was really surprised because I thought, wait a minute, these are all the people that are either on full ride or half ride scholarships. These are the people that are gonna be your doctors, your lawyers. I mean, they're top 10% at this university. The, these are the people that are supposed to have it together. Like they have better prospects for a future than the rest of the people. And they're depressed. And that was really eye-opening to me. Um, and I realized it wasn't just a me problem. It wasn't just an age problem. It wasn't just necessarily a demographic problem, a wealth or poor problem. It was an everybody problem. And um, so, yeah. I. I have to give a lot of credit to my wife. Uh, if I wasn't married, I would, I would be in some really bad places probably. She's been a great encourager to me. I remember when I was about 21, I was seriously contemplating suicide. I remember sitting on my bed with a knife at my wrist. And, um, you know, I'd just given up you tell yourself all kinds of lies, you know, they can't get any better. Um, everything is hopeless. And you think everybody's out to get you. And you don't know how to cope with it. It's just, it's a very dark place. And the devil compounds those thoughts. He really closes in on people like darkness and um, makes it really a struggle. So I've, I've been there and I know what some, some of you are going through or have gone through. Having said that, I would like to take some time um, to pray with you here on this call now. Um, I've got a few more slides before we wrap up, but I wanna take some time if, you, if you've been through this to specifically pray that you get encouragement. So I'm just going to take a few moments to do that. You don't have to raise your hand if you're, if you're shy about it. I understand it's one of those things that people, they feel like there's a stigma attached to it. Um, but if you have struggles, you don't even have to admit it. I want to pray for you right now. So let's do that. And then I'll start to wrap up. Heavenly Father, I just want to take some time now to um, recognize that we are all sinful, and in that sinfulness, we struggle. It's not that we don't want to do better. We do. It's not that we can't do better. We can with your help, but we buy into a lot of lies. Our thoughts are not formed properly. Um, there are times in our life where we go through mountains and valleys, and it seems like those mountaintop experiences are the times where we have connected with you, where we have invited you into our life. Sometimes we, along the way, have bad thoughts and they lead to bad feelings and bad actions and we get bad habits. And we start to develop portions of our character that are detrimental. And so we, Lord, we recognize that we need help. And I want to pray tonight specifically for people here on this call or those that may even watch later, 
Lord, we have learned that you want holistic healing for us. You don't just want us to have healthy bodies. You want us to be healthy in our minds and you want our emotions to be healthy. You want everything about us to be healthy. And so I pray for those that are struggling, Lord, draw near to them. I know in Revelation chapter three, it says you stand at the door and knock. And sometimes Lord, we don't even have the, the energy or the strength to get up off the couch and answer the door. And we need your help so desperately. And so we just ask that you would come near to those people that the darkness is drawing in on them. Lord, bring healing to their life. Help them to tell themselves the truth that's found in your word um, about their own lives and lead them on the path that leads to everlasting. We just pray that you would be their strength and you would uh, hold their hand and take them along this journey of, of life and uh, help them find healing all the way to the heavenly city. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So having said that, I do want to bring your attention to a couple of resources um, that I am familiar with. Uh, one of them is an overcoming seminar. It's done by Chad Cruiser and Fadia, his wife. If you don't know Chad, Chad, um, he runs Anchor Point Films. He's got a, a several powerful documentaries, but he has a six-part DVD seminar on gaining victory over bad habits. And I, he goes over these principles. And I know Chad, I've talked to him many times. Um, Chad has had his own struggles with mental health. And, um, you know, he told me one of the last times I seen him, he would have cyclical depression. It's hit at the same time every year, every year, every year. Um, it was after he had been to Iceland for six months. And it was in the time where it was really dark. He didn't get all of that sunlight. But it started to hit him cyclically every year. And he came across some things in Ellen White's writings um, that helped him. One of them was when you're in those low spots, eating fruit. He would, he said he ate only fruit for two weeks and it kicked him out of his depression. Um, and he was able with that, with God's help, reading the Bible, he was able to work through a process where it it kicked him out of that cyclical depression. And if he ever starts to go down that road again, he knows that this works and it can help lead him out of that. But he has some six part DVD series overcoming seminar. You can get it on Anchor Point Films um, if you're interested in that. Um, another one is a book that my wife and I have gone through. This is written by a Christian writer. He's not an Adventist guy. Um, but the things that he talks about in this book are so true. Um, it's just biblical principles, really hammering this idea of telling yourself the truth and, you know, teaching yourself to believe God's word and not the lies that you tell yourself. So this is a book, uh, we recommend there's some, there's some doctors at my church, uh, at least, well, he's a doctor. His wife is uh, training to be a counselor. They do depression and anxiety recovery seminars. And this is one of the books that they have people read. Uh, it's very sound. Uh, they, um, they have gone through the Nedley Health Solutions training program, so they're, they're familiar. Dr. Nedley helps people with depression and anxiety. One of the things that he does when he has his patients is he removes their electronic devices from them for three weeks. Okay. No phone for you for three, no more Facebook, right? No Netflix, no more any of that. No more YouTube. You just removing it because 
they know and recognize it is a hindrance to your healing. Okay. So if you're having, um, if you're having trouble, Medley Health Solutions is another um, organization you can look at for resources for anxiety and depression. How do you spell it? Nedley, N-E-E-D-L-E-Y, I think. It might just be L-Y, but it's N-E-E-D, yeah, N-E-E-D, I think L-Y. Um, Dr. Neil Nedley is the doctor who started it. It's in Weimar, California. Um, my local congregation that I belong to, my church, they put on depression and anxiety recovery seminars. And um, this time around, they're doing something a little different. They're actually having a uh, online component because of COVID. You know, for people who are not, they don't feel like they're in a good state to go out and be around other people. Um, it's not the primary way that they recommend doing that because they believe that you have higher success when you're in person and you can interact with people. Um, but if you're on this call or you see this video at a later time and you want to um, interact with them or get some resources from them or talk with them, I've already talked with them prior, they're more than willing to help people. And you know, this is one of their passions is depression and anxiety because they know it's such a big problem. And so I can get you contact information for Dr. Heldzinger if you want. Um, you know, just contact me. My email is keith at littlelightstudios.tv, or you can go to our website, fill out the contact form, and it'll go to me. Or you can contact one of the Time Science admins. They can get a hold of me, and one way or another, I can get you connected with the Heldzingers. Um, Great. And so, of our um, email address in the chat one more time just for that so anyway um is there any questions that anybody else has um after all of that because i know you know depression anxiety is it's not easy and it's it's not an easy walk um, and, you know, if anybody has something they want to, they want to share or something that they have a question about, I'm, I'm open to that for a little bit. I have a little bit of time I can, um, spare, or if you're just tired and you want to go to bed, um, you can all do that. No, there are, there are actually some questions and comments in the chat. So, um, maybe Kason can just, um, ask those questions there and then we'll, um, ask, invite people to just raise your hands if you have any questions as well. Yeah, do we have any raised hands first? Because I see they're mostly comments, um, but we have any, um, look, we'll take the raised hands first and then we can do the comments afterwards. Are there any hands right now um, wanting to comment on this? Let's go with the comments, with a question. No, there was a question in the chat before. Okay. The um, how do you encourage a Christian to seek professional help when they only want to rely on that and prayer without therapy. Yeah, I, I know that there are, there are strong feelings about that. Um, and that's okay. I, I understand not everybody trusts um, physicians. Not everybody trusts especially when it comes to mental health, not everybody trusts psychiatrists and all that because some of the methods that they use, they don't believe are sound or biblical. And um, I would agree that's, that's probably true. What I would not encourage is to go to somebody who's not Christian and does not approach this from a Christian standpoint. But I do believe that there are people who are they have professional credentials and they approach this from a Christian standpoint. And for example, like the Heldzingers that I just talked about, they're not doing this with medication. That's not what they're promoting. They're promoting 
lifestyle changes, they're promoting cognitive behavioral therapy, um, those kinds of things. So just because you have credentials doesn't mean you're automatically out as a help. Uh, I think people need to be aware that there are people who can deal with this in different ways, not the traditional psychotherapy, psychoactive drugs, Freudian mindset. There are alternative ways of dealing with this. And if you have credentials behind your name, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, there's a lot of people in this world, they won't listen to you unless you have credentials. Mm -hmm. I can give you a talk on diabetes, heart disease, you know, those kind of things, but you're not gonna listen to me because I don't have an MD, right? I might tell you the same information, but you're gonna say, well, you're not a doctor. You don't know what you're talking about, right? Well, I might know what I'm talking about, but some people need that as their level of trust. Um, now, when it comes to Bible study and prayer, those things are certainly helpful. And I would not encourage anybody to stop doing that. Keep doing it. It's going to help. Um, if they think that's the only thing, I would say if they're not having serious incapacitating issues, I'm not going to limit the power of God for him to work through his word and prayer. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if they're having serious incapacitating issues, I'm still not going to limit the power of God, but seeking outside help could be helpful. Um, you know, I, to be honest, I have at many points in my life probably tried to reach out to a counselor. Never quite worked out. Um, even still today, I believe because of what I've been through, I believe at some point I'm probably going to hit a brick wall. I may even have a breakdown at some point because I know I haven't dealt with things the most healthy way. And there's some things that keep me from dealing with it in the most healthy way. There are times in, in my life, even recently, that I should probably be going through one of these programs myself. I've been pretty, pretty low. And it's hard to get out of that. Um, so, yeah, these people can provide helpful tools. You don't want to force somebody because you don't want to make what they're dealing with already worse. Again, encourage them. Let them know what's available. Come alongside them. And I think if you can help show them results, other people that have been through it. I mean, you use that in advertising, right? Testimonials. It can help. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, Jason, I saw another question that said, well, um, I think our friend Filoni made a comment, made a comment here, I'm just gonna read it. Um, it says, when you have a broken bone, you rely on a doctor or orthopedic surgeon to fix it. When you have breast cancer, you rely on an oncologist and get it diagnosed and removed. Similarly, when there's a problem with the brain or the psychological processes, then you need to seek the professional guidance in that regard and rely on God to work through the psychiatrist or psychologist uh, or counselor and help you through the mental break or the brain fixing as it were. And I think that's uh, consistent with um, part of what you just said, um, Keith, that um, seeking professional help doesn't mean that one is not also simultaneously relying on God because God can use somebody to help us, whether the person is, you know, has the letters behind your names or not. Um, but what is key is to recognize that um, all of these situations, all of these challenges can be overcome through God's help. And once we pray, then he will direct us. If it is to a person, then he will direct us, of course, to the right person that can help us with that. Absolutely. Uh, there's a solution to these things, you know, and we know that biblically. I mean, ultimately, Jesus is the solution for all of our problems. And, um, but yeah, he may use other people to help you get to that solution. Sorry, that's my clock again. I'll, uh, anybody else have another question or anything? All right. Um, Kason, were there any other questions or were there just comments?
I'm not seeing any more um, question, um, questions. Um, are there any hands? Uh, yeah, so before we actually just uh, look at wrapping up tonight's uh, discussion, we just giving you a chance another maybe another two minutes before we actually just uh, allow for final closing. I'm not seeing any right now, Leon. So I guess we can just have Keith do his just, I don't know, closing arguments. <laughs> and uh, then, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I do know that uh, persons may have questions. <laughs> Maybe difficult, as we said before, to ask them. But um, I just want to just um, highlight one of the things that you mentioned about um, habits that, um, that inform character and that can become um, very useful um, towards the development of character and how just starting a good habit can morph into something really great. And even diet is connected with that because for many of us who struggled with, okay, making some adjustments to diet, you know, I think many persons would agree or would have this a similar experience um, that I had or that other persons would have had where you think that, okay, this, I can't do this. And then it's only when you have prayed about it and actually started doing it that you realize that it becomes easier to do. And then it becomes a part of your character because at some point in the future, you look back, or in the present, you look back and you say, wow, I really thought that this was something that was impossible or that I couldn't do. But look at the journey that I've taken and now my mind, so we started at the action, but now my mind, which is the before, is now totally aligned with the character. So I, I love what you said about some of the things that we can do, bearing in mind that it is God that gives us the strength to do them in the first place. And so we have to exercise that faith. And God says, do something that we have the strength to do, then we have to do it. Just like the woman that went to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment. She had to make that walk. It's not in her strength because God is the one that gave her the strength, but she still have, has to exercise what she was able to do. And all of us here tonight, there's something that we can do. God has give us, given us hands. He has given us a mind. He has given us feet. He has given us a body. He has given us family. There are things that we can do. Let us just start with the things that are at our disposal that we can do. And then God will definitely uh, take it from there and transform it and make it into, and make us into the person that he wants us to be. So I just wanted to make that comment as well before you um, make any other final comments. Yeah, I guess I would just add to that. Um, sometimes you're, you're very crippled with anxiety and depression. And sometimes that action is merely a thought. Um, I think you can see that in the case of the demoniac. The guy is helpless, you know, internally he's crying out. His thoughts are directed toward Jesus, you know, and asking Jesus, save me. It's a first step. And that can be your first step too. Um, I realize in a forum like this, not everybody feels like it's a safe place. So. I'll say this, if you have any struggles and you want somebody to pray with you or you want somebody to listen to you, feel free to contact me. Um, I can put my email in the chat. I've, I've been through this. It's not easy. Um, there are times I still go through it. You know, I'm not, I'm not 100% yeah. done with this yet. Um, another thing I can say is there are some things that I do that I believe do help a lot. Um, and I mentioned I work in, in an office without windows, which isn't good. That doesn't help. But I do eat a plant-based diet, and I think that helps. And more recently, um, through my wife's encouragement, you know, we got a treadmill. And every morning, I go down for a half an hour, and I walk. And it's amazing how much that has helped me. And I'm not just walking at it. I'm walking at a pretty good pace. You know, it's like four miles an hour. I'm not, I'm not just loafing on the treadmill, right? I'm, just, I'm walking. <laughs> so you're getting exercise and that exercise helps a lot. And I notice when I do that, 
it really helps my mental state. I'm not as not as frustrated. I don't get down as easy. You know, it just helps keep me elevated, help keeps me bolstered. And while I may still be dealing with unresolved issues that I'm probably going to have to deal with someday, I have no doubt. Um, in the meantime, you know, I'm, I'm able to move along and keep dealing with life as, as need be. Um, so that's, that's something I, I can testify that, that definitely helps is the exercise. It helps a lot. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. One last question um, that, I, that I kind of formulated when you spoke. Well, one passage that came to my mind when you spoke, I, I'm trying to remember whether you brought it up to, but Proverbs 23, verse 7 kind of underscores what you had said earlier to where it says, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he, or as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And um, that, that aligns well with what you said about thoughts being the fundamental building block of character. Uh, and you you mentioned that the, the the nexus between truth and thoughts, or what should be that nexus between truth and thoughts. When you said, "Tell yourself the truth," um, I think that that is something that is very deep and something that <laughs> would probably take us hours to fully explore uh, from scriptures. But that is very powerful to me. Uh, because only when we have that relationship with Christ will we allow him to inform us of what truth is and to help us to accept the truth um, about ourselves as well as the world in which we live. Um, and without Christ, it is really impossible. I, I like to say that from my understanding of scripture, Truth is not a, a mere, merely a concept. It is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And when we have come into a relationship with him, he is able to convict us through the Holy Spirit of truth. And many of the things that we, that some persons struggle with, that we struggle with, are these untruths. But because we are immersed in the world, the things that are not true become true. And we really need Christ to unshackle us from these things so that we can really see what is true. But my last question, my question though, um, and the only question I had here was, what about those things that cause deep pain and have um, psychological and uh, physical impacts on our bodies and minds and even our relationships with others um, that cause deep depression? How can we relieve ourselves of these. So in other words, some persons may say, it's not that I am the struggle, the depression that I have and so on and so forth, is, can actually come from um, how I was treated in the past when I was a child. It's not just something now that I'm an adult, uh, you know? Um, many bad things happened. I gave my life to Christ, I became a Christian, but I still have those very same thoughts and I, I'm still impacted by those things from the past and I still get depressed about those things uh, in the past uh, that, has, that have happened in my past. Um, what are some of the things that you might have said even earlier that could help a person um, navigate some of those challenges or that kind of deep-seated depression? Oftentimes when things happen in the past, we see ourselves as still that person in the past. We relate to life moving forward as if we are in the past. Um, so, you know, for example, um, you know, people that have been abused, um, and when we're talking about abuse, we, we could be physical abuse, it could be sexual abuse, whatever. Um, they tend to relate the rest of their life from that standpoint. So what do I mean by that? Um, a lot of men that have been physically abused, they become tough guys. They bulk up. 
they get strong because they feel like they still have to defend that little boy. Um, women that are um, sexually abused, it carries forward. They, they are still relating to life in the future and in the present as if they're that little girl that was abused and they think that they're dirty and they think that they're uh, worthless and that nobody wants them. And when you have those deep seated issues, we, we have to learn. And, and I'm not going to say that I can say this with a hundred percent, you know, great confidence. Like I have all the answers. I'm not saying it from that stone standpoint, but I'm saying, I know that we need to learn to relate to things as we are now, not as we are then. Um, you know, some of my things go back a long time, but I'm not that age still. I'm, I might still think about it as if I'm in that space and time, but I'm not that. Um, so we have to learn to relate to events in the present as we are now, not, not, not go back to, not resort back to like when we were, I'm not five in my mind anymore. You know, you're not 12 in your mind anymore. You're not, you're not those things. But oftentimes we go, it's like we go back there and then we become five or 12 or 10 or whatever it is when it happened. And it doesn't help us relate to the problem because we're relating as if we're that age and, and we haven't, it's like we're not mentally mature anymore, you know, whereas in, in one part of our brain, we've moved on. Um, so we need to somehow get to that point where we can take a step back and say, I'm not five, I'm 40 or 30 or whatever I am. How do I relate to that situation where I'm at now? Because I'm in the here and now and I can't redeal with it back then. I mean, what's done is done. What's happened has happened. So what do I do now in the present? I like what God says in um, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. He says, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, um, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. And this verse speaks to me in, in that way, in, in the vein that I'm talking about. Because God says, like, look, I know you have issues in the past. I know you're dealing with things. But I have certain thoughts that apply to you. They apply to you here. They apply to you now. They're peaceful. They're not evil at all. And I have this expectation. We, we have a direction that we're going. There's an end. There's an expected end. I want to take you there. We keep ourselves a lot of times from going places with Jesus. You know, we're not ready to go. It's like a lot of things. We have to admit that we have a problem, right? If we're not ready to admit we have a problem, it's going to be very hard to deal with the problem. Um, in the first place, I think you start is with Jesus, you know, and whether Jesus chooses to solve that problem without anybody else intervening or whether he chooses to lead you to somebody else who he's working through to solve that problem, we still have to admit that we have the problem and we still have to admit, be ready to deal with the problem. Otherwise, there's not a lot. Like, it's just like I'm talking about in my own experience. There are some parts I know I'm not ready to deal with, which is kind of scary. Um, I don't like it that way. It's circumstantial. I know it's coming. I know I'm going to have to deal with it, but I haven't yet. And until I'm willing, willing to deal with it yet at that time, there's probably not going to be anything I can do about it. Right. Or there's not anything that God's going to be able to help me with. This is, 
you're not ready, you know? Yeah, um, Keith, I see uh, Rochelle sharing something here in the chat room. She's saying she knows someone who struggles with low self-esteem who says that she's not able to find anything in the Bible to help her as she doesn't see this theme, for example, self-esteem in the Bible. She finds no validation in her self-worth. So this person looks to secular entertainment to for value of her self-worth. It is so important for that we see the Bible as a practical guide for these issues. Pervasive self-esteem, self-worth can spiral into depression. And you know, I, I mean, as she says that, I mean, we must never undermine the, the effect of even a support group like this one, just having studies and talking about real issues because especially, not, as you said before, like even for men, we don't talk about issues that, tr that trouble us, inter emotional issues per se, just on blanket. But especially if it's an issue, for example, like depression or something that you struggle with, you don't really, it's not something that you're willing to talk about, but the fact is it exists. And if we don't first admit and acknowledge the issue in and of itself, we'll never be able to perhaps find greater avenues to ease the burden of what we're carrying. And so, as you said before, it's important that we, as Rochelle said, talk about find practical ways of dealing with these things and also to just support each other, you know, pray with each other, just to kind of acknowledge that these things exist and it's not your fault that you're in this position that you're in, but there are ways to somehow deal with them to make them a lot easier to handle. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad she actually brought that up. It reminded me of something. Um, I have it here somewhere. It's probably near me. Um, once upon a time, I picked up a Bible promises handbook. There are thousands of promises in the Bible. And you can find one of these. They're categorical, you know, and they will cover some of these things promises that you can claim from the word of God when you're down, when you're depressed, when you're lonely, when you, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I would highly encourage you to get one of them. In the U.S., I know you can pick one up either in a Christian bookstore or Amazon or something like that. They're usually only about 10 or $15. It's money well spent. One of my Bibles, I went through and I highlighted every single one of those verses so that I could see them. And um, in going through and reading them and highlighting them, it helps me see uh, what God thinks of me and what I can do, uh, where I can go for help. So we must never forget, like she said, that, the, that we can find what we need to in the Bible. It's, it's there. Um, sometimes people get in dark spaces. They don't remember that. Um, but you can remember that for them. And, you know, like, like Kaysen was saying, you know, come alongside people, pray with them, encourage them, be there for them. That's the ministry. It's a huge ministry. And if you think about the amount of people in this world that are depressed and they're not getting anything done about it, we just seen the statistics. It was like 60%, you know, unresolved that's a lot of people you know, and that's the people that are depressed right we're not talking about 60 percent of all people who are depressed we're just saying of those that are 60 percent aren't getting any help it's still a lot of people um so a ministry that you can do is the ministry of encouragement be that yeah. healing on the people's souls they need it and we're not just good at lying to ourselves we're good at lying to other people, you know. How are you doing? I'm fine. No, you're not. You're not really fine, you know. Um, a lot of times people say that, and they're they're so depressed. They know how to put on the smile on their face and go to church and happy Sabbath and all of that, and they're really dealing with issues. So, be that person people can be real with because it makes breaking the walls, you know, easier. And um, it's, it's okay if things aren't fine. You know, church is a hospital for sinners. If, if you can't show up and everything's not perfect, 
you probably need to find a different church because you need a church where you can find healing and you need a group of people around you that you can find healing. And, um, you know, I just, that, that's the way I feel about it. You, you need to be able to work through things. Otherwise, you're going to keep going status quo. You're going to keep saying, I'm fine, and you're not. Yeah. Which is what we talked about in Revelation 3, right? Yeah. Um, we're right. just going to give, again, I, I mean, we've been talking about a lot about, especially this, this touches on concern, a lot of us in a very deep way. I'm just giving anyone else on the platform an opportunity to just... Uh, just share a thought or your question, pitch your question to Keith for the next two minutes or there about because we need to wrap up. I know, I, I'm, I'm kind of sure that there are persons who want to ask questions, but don't be shy about it. Um, it is a personal issue, but I mean, I guess it's being addressed right now. So this is the safest place to be. Yeah. yeah. It's the safest place that we get to live on Facebook recording. You know, <laughs> oh, so oh, the Facebook. Oh, the Facebook part. Oh, that's the Facebook part. <laughs> I didn't realize. I, didn't, I I forgot that Facebook part actually. Yes. For a second. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. For a world. second, I forgot Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can understand. Oh, um, Rochelle is reminding me or saying that um, somebody. Oh, my friend Chevelle. What did she say? I didn't see. Oh, she said thanks for sharing your story and. I'm not seeing it. You have to tell me. Okay, it made me believe every word you said. Knowing from knowing it's from a person that lived it. So somebody, may God continue to bless and inspire you. So somebody is sharing that um, they love the fact that you were real, Keith, and what you shared about yourself and how you have dealt with it has been very personally inspiring as well. Yeah. Um, for those who don't, for those who have not noticed yet, Leon as well, uh, Keith left his email address. As he said before, this um, is something that he would be willing to to speak to persons one on one, or you know, even direct them, redirect them to somebody else, someone That's else. Right. So, yeah. So he left um, he left his email address. If you may see, Keith at LightStudios.tv. So you might want to utilize that. Um, are we doing a close off, or are we? Yeah, we can just allow Keith to just say yeah. one word and pray. And yeah. he, can, he can do the closing prayer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think I have anything else to add. Um, just, you know, if you need some encouragement, you need some help, here's a group. I'm sure they'd be happy to encourage you. You can reach out to me. Other than that, I just want to leave you in prayer. Um, I think that's a great place to start. I think that can open up doors that sometimes nothing else can. Yeah. And so why don't we pray? And if you want to reach out to me more extensively, you can. I'm not going to say I have all the answers, but I know some people that have helpful solutions and maybe it can be the road to your healing. So let's pray and we'll wrap this up tonight. Heavenly Father, um, we just want to ask that you would draw near to us, draw near especially to those who are struggling right now, Lord. They are dealing with depression. They're dealing with anxiety. They don't know what to do. And they're crying out. They're not even sure how to get help, where to get help, or what the help would look like. But I know that you have a way of deliverance for them. Lord, you came to save us from everything. And that means more than just sin. It means our, our bodies, our mental health, our emotional health, our physical health, all of it. You came to save us. When you healed people, you healed the whole person. We ask that for each one here, each one that's watching. Lord, lead them to healing. And um, just soothe the wounds I don't know every story here, Lord, but I know we live in a dark world and there are many horrible things that have happened to many people. Things that we would, in our human strength, say that's unforgivable. That should never be done to a person. But we know what we've done to you. And so we know that 
those hurts as, as bad as they sting, you want to forgive even that person who did the hurt. And that can be a hard thing for us to swallow on the receiving end. But Lord, we just ask that you would give us also forgiving hearts and forgiveness, Lord. We can find a lot of healing ourselves. Help us to be forgiving. Lord, we also ask that you would surround those who are listening with encouraging friends, friends that know and share the word of God, friends that can uplift, friends that can be that soothing balm. And uh, Lord, we just pray for this Bible study group. Uh, may it continue to minister in a strong and mighty way. And Lord, we just ask for your blessing tonight. May your spirit go out from among us and bless others. And uh, we just pray that you would help us to be ready for your coming when we know all the things in this world that make us so depressed and so anxious. We won't be dealing with those anymore. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, we Amen. just... Yeah, we just want to thank Keith so much for just taking time out to just bless us with his presence and with all this uh, information. Um, it was a lot tonight and it, it was very personal for some of us. And so we just want to express our gratitude for what was um, given to us tonight. And we pray that those that are here will somehow take this information and bless the lives of others that are around us right now. And um, in some ways, we just want to express our gratitude for your presence here tonight as well. Um, just being with us uh, next week, I believe uh, we, we touch, we look at the sex trap. Is that right, Leon? Yes, yes. The yes. so next week topic is we look at the sex trap, how the mind is molded by sexual intimacy. Um, you can't afford to miss that. Um, if Keith can pop in for a second, he, he's indicted as well too. <laughs> um, so we just want um, to just say thank you so much for just sharing in our ministry. Thank you so much for helping. I mean, you are, you are a part of all this. I'm just reminding you again, um, somebody asked again for me to say, it. it's the next week is a sex trap, uh, how the mind is molded by sexual intimacy. Um, so we're gonna, again, put our announcement flyers out by Wednesday or Thursday. So we ask you to share it, share it with your friends. We're asking everybody here to just bring someone else with you next week so you can actually um, engage us or just uh, at the same point in time, just sharing all of what we, is being offered by this ministry. I don't know, Leon, do you have anything else to share? Uh, no, that, that would be it. And next week should be led by Dr. Eric, Dr. Walsh. Yes, Dr. Yes. Er, 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 Walsh should be leading yeah. us next week as well. So we just want to thank everyone for just being here. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. And Keith, please thank your family and your wife. <laughs> for those, excellent, excellent. And for those persons who are on Facebook, thank you for joining. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Um, at the same time, we start very early. We start on time. If we don't start exactly on the minute, we start maybe one or two minutes thereafter. So yeah. to be with us early. Thank you guys yeah. again. And good night and bye-bye to Facebook. Yeah.